Hey, welcome everyone to our quality of service deep dive. I'm thrilled to have so many people with us right now. We've got a bunch watching from our platform at our website. We've got people joining us on YouTube and LinkedIn and Facebook. And I'm going to do my best to jump around and look at all those different platforms as we have some of our Q&A discussions today. But uh, welcome. We're going to have some fun today with quality of service, which to be honest, it's my favorite topic. Out of everything I teach in the world of Cisco, quality of service, it's my favorite topic. And we're going to cover quality of service from the very basics today all the way through really advanced CCIA level stuff. Because I, I was thinking, what do I do my next deep dive on? And there's this one technology that shows up on the CCNA exam. It shows up on the Encore exam. It shows up on the Service Provider Core exam. It shows up on the Collaboration Core exam. It's quality of service. It's, it's all over the place. So regardless of which certification path you're going down, you probably need to know quality of service. And we're going to get you ready for that today. Now, if you don't know me, my name is Kevin Wallace. And just here's my super quick bio, I promise. But again, my name is Kevin Wallace. And I've got a couple of CCIEs, uh, one in enterprise infrastructure and one in collaboration. Been a CCIE for over 20 years. So finally, I reached that... Uh, that, that really cool status of what they call a lifetime emeritus, which I'm really excited about. That means I get to keep my CCA for the rest of my life and don't have to retest or anything. So uh, pretty stoked about that. Those CCA exams are getting really, really tough these days. Well, they were always tough, but uh, they're getting super challenging these days. My experience with uh, Cisco stuff goes back to the beginning. I worked with the very first Cisco model of router back in 1989, the old Cisco AGS Plus router. I worked as a, an instructor for various Cisco learning partners for about 14 years. In my real world experience, worked in university, but one of the coolest things I did, my family and I are huge uh, Disney fans. You might, I'm not sure, I think you might be able to see some Disney uh, trinkets on the uh, bookshelf behind me there. But uh, I was a network designer, one of five network designers down at Walt Disney World in Florida. I got to design the network that uh, ties together the different theme parks down there. The Magic Kingdom and Epcot and the studios and uh, Animal Kingdom. A lot of the resorts, I got to design and help install that. That was super, super cool. Uh, and in our courses, I tend to weave in a lot of Disney stories as we do that. Written a bunch of books, uh, done a lot of video courses for Cisco Press with all the derivative works. I tried to count one time. I'm actually not sure. I think I've done about 15 books for Cisco Press. More recently, I got to be a speaker at uh, some different Cisco Live events and each time awarded the Distinguished Speaker Award. The, the bottom line is I've been doing this a while and I love it. I am passionate about this stuff. Cisco has been, uh, or Cisco knowledge and certifications, they have really helped me and my family. And I want to help you today. I was so excited this morning. I thought, you know what? I'm going to help a lot of people today. And I cannot wait to get into it. So let's begin, shall we? By the way, if you've got questions, obviously we're going to have some Q&A breaks throughout. And it's just not possible for me to answer everybody's questions. We had, uh, I checked this morning and we had nearly 1,600 people that had signed up. And that doesn't even count the people that just sort of trickle in and happen to see that it's on on those different uh, platforms. So we've got a bunch of people today. And, uh, and so I pre-apologize if I don't answer your specific question. But during each of our Q&A breaks, we'll do about three of those. And I'll try to pick out maybe two or three of the most pertinent questions that we see. But let's begin just at a super high level and, uh, and ask... What is quality of service? I saw somebody asking that in the chat before we begin. What is quality of service? And uh, why do we need it? The best definition I've ever heard for quality of service is managed unfairness. Think about that one. We've got all these different types of traffic and we're being unfair to some of them. We're, we're giving preferential treatment to perhaps voice traffic as opposed to network gaming traffic. Or, or maybe you would maybe you would prioritize network gaming traffic if that's important to you. But quality of service has been around for a long time because we would have points of congestion in the network and quality of service would say, all right, the important stuff gets to go first. The less, to, less important stuff has to wait and go a little bit later. However, there's a, there's a misconception that we don't need it anymore because we really do. 
Today, people say, well, I've got, uh, I've got gig links. I've got 10 gig links. Even going out to the internet, maybe I'm going out to the internet at 100 meg. I don't have, quote unquote, slow links. I don't have 56K links out there anymore. So I don't need it. Actually, you might. Consider this. We've got a router sitting between the enterprise network, where SW1 is, and the internet. Admittedly, both high-speed links. Uh, we're coming into the router on a gig link. We're exiting on a fast ethernet link. Those are relatively fast links. But do you see there's a speed mismatch? There's a 10 to 1 speed mismatch. We're potentially receiving traffic from the LAN at 10 times the rate that we can send it out. So what quality of service tries to do, it takes all that data that we cannot send right now because there's simply not enough bandwidth and it's going to store it in a queue or a buffer. And as uh, one of the demonstrations today, I'm going to be using this, this glass and we're going to be pouring, we're going to be pouring some water in it to, uh, to show how we're filling up, filling up a router queue. And then when bandwidth becomes available, we'll take the traffic out of the queue and send it on its way. You might say, well, within my network, forget the WAN, forget the internet, within my network, we're all gig. We don't need it. You might. But check this out. Here we've got a server farm. We've got three servers and they're all going into a gig switch and it, we're leaving that switch at a gig rate. Well, an issue with that is that's an aggregation point. We're potentially having traffic come into that switch, a total of three gig worth of traffic, and we're trying to leave on a one gig link. That's another opportunity where we might use quality of service. However, I want you to understand that this is not just a fix for any congestion problem you might have. That's just not realistic. You need quality of service for times of periodic congestion. If you're congested 24 seven, you've got to get some more bandwidth. But if you have periods of congestion, maybe, there, maybe at a certain time of day, a network backup occurs and uh, that saturates some links on your network. Or maybe first thing of the morning, everybody's turning on the computer, they're synchronizing a bunch of files with the cloud. Maybe that's a period of congestion. Quality of service can help out in periods of congestion. But again, if you're congested all the time, you need some more bandwidth. And quality of service, by the way, I didn't mention this earlier. Please take notes on this. There's a lot of, I got a lot of content for you today. So please, please, please take some notes on this. Quality of service breaks down into three different categories. And one of those categories, honestly, I struggle to even call it quality of service. Cisco does, so I'll tell you about it. It's called best effort. Best effort is using FIFO, queuing, F-I-F-O. First in, first out. The first packet that comes into the router is the first packet that gets exited from that queue. We're not doing any prioritization. We're not giving one type of traffic preferential treatment over another type of traffic. It's just first come, first serve, basically. I don't really think that's quality of service. Our focus is going to be on something called diff serve or differentiated services. With diff serve, as the name suggests, we're going to differentiate, we're going to distinguish between different types of traffic. And we can treat them differently. We might say network gaming traffic. Uh, we're going to set a speed limit of, let's say, 15 megabits per second. So if that network gaming traffic tries to exceed 15 megabits per second, we're going to we could use a tool that I'll show you today called policing that says, oh no, you don't, and it's going to cut it back down uh, and drop anything exceeding 15 megabits per second. But finally, we have strict QoS. This is something called integrated services. I'll tell you the one tool that falls under that category for your notes, just to, just so we're comprehensive in our discussion. It's RSVP, the Resource Reservation Protocol. With DiffServe, if I've got all these different applications and I've given some bandwidth guarantees to those different applications, let's say that application A doesn't need all of its bandwidth right now, but application C could really use some extra what well, with DiffServe, we can share, just like they taught in kindergarten. We can share. We can let some of, some of application A's unneeded bandwidth be used by application C because it's not being used otherwise. 
RSVP is not so understanding. RSVP does not share. What it was, uh, the, the line on Friends, uh, Joey does not share food. Well, RSVP does not share bandwidth. It's going to reserve, it's the resource reservation protocol. It's going to reserve a chunk of bandwidth for the duration of an application. And even if that application doesn't need it at the moment, even if another application does need it, we're not going to give it to him. It's very hard and fast reservations. Our focus, though, it's going to be on diff serp. So that's an overview of what quality of service is, its managed unfairness, why we might need it even in today's networks, because we do have places in our network that are aggregation points where we do have speed mismatches. And we talked a little bit about the three different categories. Again, our focus is going to be on diff serve. So let's jump into the real meat now of our discussion today, shall we? Uh, and by the way, I'm guessing this is going to be between three and four hours. Actually, it's probably going to be closer to three hours as I was going through it this morning because I, I know you've got things to do later today and I want you to want you to be able to plan that. Tell you what, I'll, I'll, make, you a, I'll make you a promise right now. We will not exceed three and a half hours. How about that? because I, I want to be super respectful of your time. I, I know personally, I get a little irked sometimes if I go to a meeting and it goes way past what, uh, uh, what, what they said it was going to go. So I'll just make that commitment to you right now. We're not going to exceed three and a half hours today, promise. All right, let's get into these different quality of service mechanisms because quality of service is, it's not one tool. It's a collection of tools. And we're going to go through these different categories of tools that fall under the umbrella that we call quality of service. First up is classification and marking. And the reason I have a picture of an airline boarding ticket is when you get on a plane. Now, for... I was trying to think when it happened, uh, but uh, I think about a year or so ago, uh, my wife and I, we finally reached that medallion status where we get to get on a little bit early. We'd been working on that for years. But uh, when they say, you know, it's time for you to board, and they call like sky priority, when we go up to the, uh, when we go up to the gate to get on the plane, Oh, and I'm seeing a lot of great comments coming in saying, hey, take your times, uh, take your time. We can enjoy it. We'd love it if it was like six hours long or whatever. I, I really appreciate that. I really appreciate that. And, um, but yeah, I, I, I just, sometimes I just go till I'm done. Uh, I mean, I, I just go and go and I go off on tangents and I just want to keep it tight for you today because I look at the stats. It tends to drop off after a period of time and I want to give you all the value I can I want to serve you and to do that best, I'm going to, I'm going to keep it tight today. And, and I, that's my commitment I'm making to you. Who knows, next time I might say, nah, we're going to go for a marathon. But today I'm going to keep it tight for you. But classification is when we go up to that gate agent and before they let us get on early, they look at our boarding pass. They don't say, Mr. and Mrs. Wallace, can you produce the boarding pass from the time you went to uh, to Orlando and uh, to uh, Los Angeles and to Denver and to Austin. No, they don't make us prove every single time by producing all these documents that were frequent flyers. There's a marking on our boarding pass that says sky priority we, uh, for Delta. We get to go on early. That's what quality of service can do. We're going to categorize our different categories of traffic and then we're going to mark them. It's just like putting that sky priority marking on a boarding pass. We're going to put a quality of service marking, and we're going to get into how the math behind that works today. We're going to put a quality of service marking on packets or even frames at layer two. So the next router or the next switch that gets that packet or frame, it's going to be able to very quickly, very efficiently look at that marking and make a forwarding decision or dropping decision based on that marking. It's going to be a big time saver. But classification and marking by themselves don't really, don't really do anything. What we need are quality of service mechanisms that will look at that marking and do something based on that marking. One thing is queuing. Now, there's going to be a lot of discussion today about queuing. Again, the idea is we're coming into a router faster than we can send it out of the router. Well, that, out, uh, that outbound interface, we call it the egress interface, it's going to allocate some memory called a buffer or a queue. Let's imagine it's this glass right here, and I'll try not to spill on my keyboard. 
had a bit of an accident while I was preparing this morning, so I uh, hope my keyboard works through uh, works through class. But let's say we've got this traffic coming in to this queue because we just don't have bandwidth to send it at the moment. Now the idea is we're going to store this traffic until bandwidth uh, bandwidth lightens up and we can send it, and then we'll send it we'll send it on its way. But you see, this queue, this glass, it's only so big. If I poured this whole pitcher of water in it, it would overflow. And that's a possibility. We could have our queue overflow, and then if we try to put a packet in that queue, what's gonna happen? We're gonna drop it. So what we can do is take this one queue, and we can divide it up into multiple sub queues. So here I've got a couple of smaller sub queues. Now together, they're making that one big queue, but I've divided it into a couple of categories. Maybe this is my voice over IP sub queue, and maybe there's a little bit of voice traffic. And then the other one is my best effort queue. There's a lot more best effort traffic, maybe a little bit more voice traffic. Here comes some more best effort traffic. And you see if I kept pouring right now, it would overflow and we would start dropping all, some of these best effort packets. But meanwhile, the voice packet queue is not full. It's not overflowing. You see what we did? Just by doing some really basic queue separation, I was able to protect my voice traffic just by putting it in its own container. Now, here's a recommendation from Cisco. You might want to write it down when we're talking about creating sub queues. Cisco recommends that we create no more, so this isn't a, you don't have to have this many, but Cisco says create no more than, for your notes, 11 sub queues. Don't have more than 11 classes of traffic because if, if everybody is special, then nobody is special. Now what we just talked about queuing, you might want to put this in your notes, that's sometimes referred to as congestion management. We're trying to, to manage the congestion in that queue by splitting things into different categories. But if this queue, or even, even if um, one of our sub queues, if it filled to capacity and started to overflow, it wouldn't just be dropping the low priority traffic in this sub queue uh, or the high priority. It would it'd be dropping everybody. We're not distinguishing between who gets dropped. Uh, but besides dropping everybody, there's another really insidious side effect that happens. If you remember your study of TCP, you go through the three-way handshake, I send you a synchronization or a SYN, a send message saying, hey, let's talk. And you respond with an ACK and you want to talk to me too, so you send me a SIN. So again, I send you a SIN. That's the first part of the three-way handshake. You send me a SIN ACK. That's part two. And then I acknowledge your SIN. So it's SIN, SIN ACK, ACK. And that's the three-way handshake. And then I'll send a segment. Once I get an acknowledgement, I thought, well, that worked pretty well. I'm going to double it. I'll send, you, uh, I'll send you two segments. You acknowledge that, I'll send you four segments. And you see, the TCP window size grows. It's called a sliding window. It grows and grows and grows. Now, what happens if one of those packets gets dropped? Or we don't hear back from the other side within a certain amount of time? We're going to realize that we're sending too aggressively, and that TCP flow is going to shrink its window size down from... Maybe it's 32768 uh, bytes down to, uh, we're going we're gonna to shrink it back down to something much, much less than that uh, because we were sending too aggressively. Well, with congestion avoidance, we're trying to prevent the queue ever from filling to capacity so we don't drop everybody and we don't have everybody simultaneously go into this TCP slow start where they reduce their window size. It's not a big deal if it happens to one TCP flow, but if it happens to everybody all at once, there, there's a name for that for your notes. It's called TCP synchronization, and it results in an incredibly inefficient use of bandwidth. Another category of tools you might want to write down, I don't have it on the screen, it's called traffic conditioners. Traffic conditioners include policing and shaping. They're going to set a speed limit kind of like the, uh, the, the network gaming traffic I was telling you about earlier, they're going to set a speed limit and they're going to say for this type of traffic, we're not going to exceed this amount of bandwidth. And I'm going to show you later what, what we could do if we do exceed that amount of bandwidth. So policing and shaping, they're going to work differently. I've got a whole section on that coming up, but their main purpose in life is to set a speed limit on traffic. 
And finally, there's, uh, oh, and why did I have the bowl of soup there? Uh, it, it just reminds me, every time I talk about this, it reminds me of the old Seinfeld episode. Uh, remember where you go to try to order soup from this guy, and if, if you don't order it correctly, he says, no soup for you, come back, one week. And that's kind of what policing does. Policing says, if you exceed this limit, I'm going to drop you. It's going to say, no bandwidth for you, come back. Literally, come back. You have to be retransmitted. No bandwidth for you. Come back. That's policing. Shaping, it, it's kinder and gentler. Shaping says, I'm so sorry. We, we just don't seem to have enough bandwidth to send you at the moment. But uh, no worries. We're just going to store you here in this queue temporarily. Then when bandwidth becomes available, we'll take you out of the queue and we'll send you on your way. Much more on that coming up later today. Finally, though, there's link efficiency. Here we're trying to make the most efficient use of relatively limited WAN links. And to be honest, I'm not going to put much focus on this today because this really isn't used very much. This was back when we had WAN links that had speeds of less than 760. That was the, we used to go through the math to prove why this was the magic number. But if your link was less than 768 kilobits per second, you should use something called link fragmentation and interleaving. And there was also RTP header compression you could use on links less than two meg. Most of our links are so fast today, we don't need to worry about it. But just so you understand, just to put things in context, let me give you one example. I've got, um, I, I couldn't find a good picture of a triple tractor trailer truck on screen. And, the, but imagine we've got this, truck, or I guess they call that the tractor, and then they've got three trailers behind them. Have you ever seen those on the road? I don't even think they're allowed in certain states. They're called LCVs, longer combination vehicles, where you're pulling three trailers. <laughs> I would not want to drive one of those things. But let's imagine, you're sitting, uh, you've, you've got a little tiny sports car, and you're sitting behind one of these big triple tractor trailer trucks at a traffic light. And imagine that that triple tractor trailer truck represents a big, big, big data frame. Your little tiny sports car represents maybe a voice frame. Well, the light turns green, the triple tractor trailer starts to go through the intersection. <laughs> the first trailer goes through and <laughs> the second and by the time the third trailer goes through, who knows, the light might be red again. The bottom line is that big payload took so long to get through the intersection, it delayed you. That's what's happening on slow links if we've got a big data frame and a smaller frame behind it. It's going to take so long for that big data frame to get out of the interface, it's going to delay our little tiny voice packet behind us. So what do we do? Well, imagine we took that big triple tractor trailer and we took each of those trailers and put them behind their very own tractor. I hope I'm using the right terminology here. In other words, we've got three semis on the road now instead of just one big one. Well, now that we've got three separate vehicles, your little sports car, it's nimble, it's agile, it can weave in and out. So it's gonna get ahead of some of that traffic. And just like that little sports car could get through the intersection quicker, your little tiny voice packet can get out of the interface quicker. Because we take that big data packet, we bust it up, and just like we're shuffling a deck of cards, we shuffle in the little tiny voice packets in amongst the now fragmented data packets. And it gets the voice out sooner. Again, you only need to do that if your link speed is less than 768K. So that's all I'm going to say about that because that's probably not a common issue that we're running into. But those are the categories of our quality of service mechanisms. Hey, let me interrupt myself really quick. I wanted to share with you that I just came out with a new free guide. It is so critical that we get hands-on experience when we're practicing for our Cisco exams, not only to do well on the exam, but to do good in the real world. But a lot of certification candidates are concerned that it's too expensive to get that hands-on practice. Well, I just came out with this new free guide that tells you four ways of getting that hands-on experience with little or no cost. And you can get the guide for free. Just go to kwtrain.com slash four ways. Again, that's kwtrain.com slash four ways. All right, let's get back to the video. Now, I said we were gonna talk about how that marking happens because Cisco says we should classify Put, them in, put our traffic into categories, no more than 11, we should classify our traffic as close to the source as possible. That way, 
it doesn't have to be reclassified at the next router or the next switch. Those, ne those next hops are going to be able to just very quickly, very efficiently look at that marking and make a decision. So let's classify and mark our traffic as close to the source as possible. And we've got a few markings to pick from. And we're going to get a bit mathematical here. So uh, be sure and take lots of notes. First, let's talk layer two. If we had a trunk, like a dot one Q trunk, we know that a uh, dot one Q trunk adds four bytes. They're called tag bytes. We add four tag bytes to a frame, except the native VLAN, obviously. But we're going to add these four tag bytes. And three bits inside of those four tag bytes are called the priority bits. We can use those three priority bits inside a dot one Q frame. We can use those three bits to indicate the priority of this, of this frame. So when the switch gets it, it can put it in a sub queue that gets sent first. We can prioritize our voice traffic like that. But let's think about it though. We got three bits. How many decimal values can we make with three bits? Well, it's two raised to the power of three. So that's eight. We've got values in the range of zero through seven. So we've got eight possible markings we could have. Cisco says not so fast though. They prohibit us. They don't stop us, but they say you're not allowed to mark your traffic with a COS, a class of service value. That's what we're talking about. You're not allowed to mark your traffic with a COS value of a, of a six or seven because we're going to reserve those for network use. So our production traffic, including voice and video, the best COS marking we can use is a five. By the way, Cisco IP phones, by default, those, those bad boys, they come out of the IP phone with a COS value of a five. So that's a big help right there. The Cisco phones do prioritization before they even send the packets or frames out on the network. There's a challenge with COS marking, so it's a layer two marking. What happens to layer two information when it hits a router? Think of your MAC address. You've got a source and destination MAC address going to a far off host somewhere. What happens when you hit a router? It's gone. Your, your source and destination MAC addresses are only good on that segment. They get rewritten for each segment. Same thing here. Your COS values are lost when you hit a router. So we need to think about a marking that will survive a router hop. And back in the day, there was a marking called IP precedence. And similar to COS, it would use three. It used the three leftmost bits in this byte in, a, in an IP version four header called the TOS byte, TOS. That's type of service. I, now, I said that was IP version four. There is something called the traffic class byte in IP version six. Same thing. We're go we've got this toss byte, or if you, an IP version six, it's the traffic class byte, but IP precedence is gonna use the three leftmost bits in that byte to indicate the priority of the packet. Again, we're limited to not that many markings. Two raised to the power of three is eight. Again, Cisco says, you're not allowed to use six or seven. Those are reserved for network use. So with IP precedence, we're kind of stuck here. Cisco says, uh, you can have 11 different classes of traffic, but they only give us six markings. So how does that work? Well, not too well, to be honest. That's the reason we don't or we rarely use IP precedence. Today, we use something called DSCP. Uh, and here's what it stands for. It stands for the Differentiated Co uh, Services Code Point. The Differentiated Services Code Point. And it's going to use the six leftmost bits in that toss byte. We're still not using the whole byte. We've still got bits seven and eight to go. We'll, we'll talk about those later. But DSCP, how many, how many values could we have with six bits? Two raised to the power of six? That's 64. That's a, it's almost too many. Uh, in fact, it does cause a real issue because if I just pick a value in that range of zero through 63 that I consider to be priority traffic, Maybe, maybe I say my best traffic, I'm going to mark it, I'm going to mark it with, a, with a value of, 60, uh, of, uh, of 26. And I send that over to you. 
maybe your router thinks 26 is dirt. It thinks 30, 38, that's the way to go. That's, that's high priority traffic on your router. You see, the problem is we don't have a common frame of reference. We're just picking numbers. So the, uh, the standards body, the IETF, they did us a huge favor. The IETF went in and they pre-selected, please take notes on this, they pre-selected 21 values out of the 64 possible values. And uh, they gave them names. So we don't have to remember all the numbers. Now the names we sometimes refer to as per hop behaviors, PHBs, per hop behaviors, because this marking, this DSCP marking is going to be determining what the behavior is going to be for that packet at each router hop, because each router could have different rules. So it's a per hop behavior, a PHB. And again, there's 21 of them and they all have names and they're prioritized and they've got some different categories. We should do certain markings for certain types of traffic. And I wanna walk you through those 21, those 21 different values. So please take some notes on this. The first one is called default. And this, is, uh, this has a decimal value of a zero. And remember we're using the six leftmost bits. If I were using six bits, to represent a decimal value of zero, what do you think that would look like? Yeah, it's pretty simple, isn't it? It's six zeros. This is what we would give to default traffic, traffic that we don't have a strong opinion about, basically. But at the other end of the spectrum, think voice over IP that does have high priority. We don't want it to be delayed we're gonna to go to the very high end of these 21 values and that's called expedited forwarding. And we abbreviate that as EF. Now here's the cool thing. When you're doing the configuration in your Cisco router and assigning different values to different classes of traffic, you can use either the PHB name or the decimal value. So I could say default or I could say zero. I could say EF or I could say 46. Now, notice what 46 breaks down into, by the way. This is really cool. 46 breaks down into 101110. Let's say that I sent from my DSCP speaking router a packet marked with a 46. Bad news, your router only speaks IP precedence. When it gets this, when it gets this packet marked with a DSCP value of EF, does it say, sorry, I don't speak DSCP. I'm going to ignore your marking. No, it, it has no idea that you marked it with a DSCP value. It's just looking at those three leftmost bits in our toss byte. What are those? Take a look on screen. 101. If we were to look at 101 in isolation, what is that in decimal? Four plus one, it's a five. That's the highest IP precedence marking that we can use. So the IETF kept IP precedence in mind. There's a little bit of backwards compatibility here. And there are another seven DSCP values that are purely backwards compatible. They're purely backwards compatible with IP precedence. In other words, if I were to take a value of CS1, that's class selector one, and I put it under a microscope uh, next, to, uh, next to a DSCP value of eight, they're bit for bit identical. Notice for class selector one, the three rightmost bits are zero, zero, one. Uh, for class selector five, it's, it's one, zero, one. You see what we're doing with class selector? We're taking, we're, we're using those last, or the three leftmost bits to create values of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then we leave bit positions four, five, and six empty. This makes this purely backwards compatible with IP precedence. So even if your router spoke IP precedence and I spoke DSCP, if I sent you a class selector four, you would interpret that as an IP precedence value of a four. So that's pure backwards compatibility. Now I said we had 21 values. Those are nine. We got 12 to go. And those other 12, they fall into a category called assured forwarding. And 
out of everything we talk about today, this is what students have struggled with the most. I've taught this for over two decades. This is what students struggle with the most. So I've done my very best to simplify this for you. Among these 12 values, we're considering two different things. If I say you have a marking of AF21, that's telling me two different pieces of information. Notice that we've got four different classes on those rows. Class one, class two, class three, class four. And if you look at the three leftmost bits of any of these 12 values, it's gonna match the class number. So class one, if you're looking at the three leftmost bits, what would that look like in binary if we're trying to make a one? It would be zero, zero, one. And it's gonna be the first letter after AF. So when we see AF one anything, that one tells us that the three leftmost bits are gonna be a binary equivalent of one. Zero, zero, one for everybody in class one. Same thing for class two. If you look at class two, Look at the three leftmost bits, zero, one, zero. You look at those in isolation, that's a two. So that those first three bits determine the first number after AF. And you could loosely think of that as our priority value. The next number is the drop probability. You'll notice that we've got three columns. We've got a, a low drop probability medium drop probability, and high drop probability. Remember when we talked about, um, about weighted red earlier, weighted random early detection? I said that we were trying to avoid TCP slow start. What we were doing there, and we'll get into a, a weighted red discussion in a moment, but what we were doing is, I'll use my coconut water as an example. We were going in and we were setting a minimum threshold and a maximum threshold. And what we do with weighted red, and I'll show you how to set this up in a few moments, but if traffic exceeds the minimum threshold, then there's the possibility, not the guarantee, but there's the possibility that that traffic is gonna be dropped. And is that traffic, is the depth of the queue increases above that minimum threshold as it goes up, the probability of dropping that packet goes up. It starts out at 0%, eh, 1%, 2%. We might be at a 20% drop probability when we get to this maximum threshold. If we exceed the maximum threshold, there's a 100% probability of discard. But here, check this out. Here's the difference between low, medium, and high drop probabilities. They've got different minimum thresholds. So this is the minimum threshold for high drop probability. This is the minimum threshold for medium drop probability. And this is the minimum threshold for high drop probability. So if I had a packet and our Q depth was right there, it's above the minimum threshold for high drop probability. It's possible it's gonna be thrown away if it's, uh, if, if it's one of these high drop probability values. But if it's one of the medium or low drop probability values, we haven't reached their minimum thresholds yet. So there's the zero probability that we're gonna throw it away. So we're paying attention to the markings and being more aggressive in discarding traffic that has not a lower priority, but a, but a higher drop probability. And the drop probability, that's what determines that second number. You'll notice that for the drop probability, for low drop probability, we have AF11. That second one, that's indicating that we're in that low column. Notice everybody in the low column ends in a one. One, one, two, one, three, one, four, one. And if you look at the six bits, the six DSCP bits, we said the first three, the three leftmost bits, that's the first number after AF. The next two bits, that's your drop probability and the values are gonna be either, they're gonna be either one, two, or three. And the, the, the sixth bit, it's always gonna be a zero. All of the 21 values that the IETF picked out, they're all zeros. So if, if, if you see a DSCP value that does not end in a zero as its last bit, it's not one of those values that the IETF picked out. But that's how we can treat traffic differently based on 
based on their markings. So I got a pop quiz for you. Based on this, and I thought we'd spend some extra time here because I've taught this for decades. I know this is one of the more challenging things. So I want to give you a moment here, and I want you to I'll put on some music, and I want you to calculate, and I want you to chat it in. I want you to tell me the decimal value of CS4. Class Selector 4. Tell me the decimal value and, and give me six bits because remember, oh, I'm sorry, not six bits. Uh, I want you to tell me the decimal value. So if I said, all right, CS4 or this number, what's that number going to be? Give me a decimal value. I'll give you a few seconds here to, to do the math and then we'll go through it together. So I'll put on some music. We'll see you back in about 30 seconds or so. Chat in your answers when you have it. I'm seeing some answers come in here. Now, some of you are giving me binary. You remember it said, what is the equivalent decimal value? So I want like a, a base 10 number here, not ones and zeros. What's the decimal value? Let's go through it together. CS4, we know that we're dealing with a toss byte and a byte has eight bits. And here they are. I, I showed you all eight bits. But a CS, uh, a class selector value, the number after the CS is indicating its IP precedence value. So CS4 means it's an IP precedence value of four. So let's look at those three leftmost bits and figure out what, what binary bits we would have to put in there to give us a decimal value of a four. If we look at those three leftmost bits in isolation, what's a four? It's one zero, uh, one zero, zero. But we're dealing with a DSCP value. It has six bits. So what we're gonna do is bring those bits down, the one zero zero, we'll bring those down. And remember with class selector, bit positions four, five, and six, they're all zeros. So now you see what it looks like in binary. It's one followed by five zeros. What is that in a decimal? It's a 32. And uh, yeah, I'm seeing, let's see, Bill here in our, uh, here on our on our studio interface is the first one looks like with the correct answer. Congratulations, Bill. Let's do one more. I, I, I know this is tough stuff. Let's do one more. Here, I'm giving you the decimal value. I'm saying I've got a DSCP value of 20. I want you to tell me which one of those 21 per hop behavior names it is. Give me the name. Is it default? Is it EF? Is it CS something? Is it AF something? Let me give you a few seconds to work on that. And we'll come back and work through it together. I'm seeing some answers start to come in. Let's go through it together, shall we? We know, again, let's just start with the fact that we've got eight bits in our toss byte. And we're told that our decimal value, our DSCP decimal value was, um, what was it, 20? What does 20 look like using those six DSCP bits? You remember how to do conversion? between? You, you learn this when you're doing subnetting. How do you convert from 20 into binary. Well, we go to that leftmost column, which is 32, if we just have six bits, and we say, is 20 equal to or greater than 32? No, it's not. So we put a zero in that field. Is 20 greater than or equal to 16? Yes, it is. If the answer is yes, we're gonna put a one there and we're gonna find the difference. What's the difference between 20 and 16? Four. So now we're dealing with the number of four. We go to the next column. Is four greater than or equal to eight? No, it's not. So we put a zero there. 
Then we say, is four greater than or equal to four? Yes, it is, it's equal to four. We put a one in that column and now we, we don't have any remainder. So zeros go in uh, those last two positions. That's what it looks like in decimal. Now we have to ask which one of these 21 values is that? Well, I know it's not default because those are all zeros. I know it's not expedited forwarding because it's a 46. I know it's not class selector because they have their last three bits as zeros and I've got a one in the four column. It must be some sort of assured forwarding value. And assured forwarding values, remember the, uh, the three leftmost bits, that's gonna, be, that's gonna be the first number after the AF. The next two bits, that's gonna be the second number after the AF. And then the sixth bit, it's, it's always zero. So let's bring down those first three bits, zero, one, zero and say, if we look at those three bits in isolation, what is that in decimal? It's two. So we're dealing with AF2 something. Let's look at our next two bit positions. Let's bring those down, one and zero. If we look at one and zero in isolation and say, what's the decimal equivalent of binary one zero? It's two. So that means our name, our per hop behavior name is AF22. The first two comes from the three leftmost bits. The second two comes from the next two bits. So I wanted to give you a couple of, couple of practice examples of converting back and forth. And that's a look at the markings. And now we've got layer two markings. We've got layer three markings, but the markings by themselves don't do anything. But um, we're going to be talking about for pretty much the rest of our session today, things that can look at those markings and make decisions based on those markings. And let's get back into module three and talk about weighted random early detection. We hinted at this earlier, but let's get into it. There's an industry protocol called RED, random early detection. And it's kind of like I was, I was drawing on my, let me use the other side of my water bottle. It's like I was drawing earlier. There's a minimum threshold and there's a maximum threshold. And if I'm putting uh, the industry standard of red, we're putting all traffic into this queue. And as that queue depth gets greater and greater, there's zero potential of discard until we exceed the minimum threshold. Then the probability of discard increases and increases and increases until we hit the maximum threshold. If we exceed the maximum threshold, there is a 100% probability of discard at that point. Uh, and th that's good, Red by itself is good because it does prevent us from filling to capacity and discarding everybody. But if we hit the maximum threshold, we're kind of discarding everybody anyway. So I much, much prefer Cisco's variant on red. Cisco uses weighted random early detection where everybody gets their own red profile. That's what we're looking at here on screen. This is a red profile. Notice, uh, if you look at the queue depth on the x-axis, until we get past 25 packets in the queue, and, and you can set these numbers, they're not hard in stone, but you can set them to whatever you want. But until we get past 25 packets in the queue, notice the y-axis, there's zero probability of discard. But once we exceed 25, we've got 26 packets in the queue. A little probability of discard, 27, a little bit more. It increases and increases and increases until we hit 45, that's our maximum threshold. And in this example, that means there is a 20% probability of discard. If we exceed the maximum threshold, notice there is a discontinuous leap all the way up to 100% probability of discard. So what Cisco does, it says, you know what? We're gonna set these values, the minimum threshold, the maximum threshold, and by the way, the way you set the probability of discard, it's called the mark probability denominator. We're gonna set different, we, we're gonna set a different red profile for different markings. So default, expedited forwarding, our class selector values, our assured forwarding values, by default, they all have different red profiles. Let me focus on assured forwarding because I said anything that ended in a one had a low probability of discard. And you see that here on screen. Notice that all of our PHBs that are AF something one, their minimum threshold is 35. The, uh, and let's say right now, the, 
let's say right now we've got an average of 28 packets in the queue. We've exceeded the minimum threshold for our high drop traffic, AF1323343, but I've not exceeded my minimum, uh, I've not exceeded my, uh, my medium drop threshold or my high drop threshold. So at that point, the only packets I'm going to be dropping are those marked with AF132343 or 33043. So by giving different minimum thresholds, that's how we can prefer some types of traffic over the other by dropping them at later stages, by giving them higher minimum thresholds. And we said that we were using the, the uh, six leftmost bits of the toss byte for our DSCP value. Well, that's true, but it's a toss byte. A byte has eight bits. We, we haven't done anything yet with bit positions seven and eight. We're gonna use those if we want to, you don't have to, but optionally, you can use those for a feature called ECN, Explicit Congestion Notification. And bit positions seven and eight are a way for two routers to talk to one another and politely ask the sender to slow down. You see, if I've got two routers and I'm sending traffic faster than this other router can handle it, and we exceed that minimum threshold, what does it do? Bam, it drops traffic. What happens when we drop a packet? That TCP flow goes into slow start, bam. So we're forcing the other side into TCP slow start by dropping, tra violently dropping traffic. Explicit congestion notification is much more civilized. Explicit congestion notification says, I seem to be getting a little full, uh, router R1. Would you mind voluntarily reducing your window size? Thanks. That's what ECN does. It is going to politely ask the sender to slow down, and the sender will say, oh, sure, I'm so sorry. I get a little bit chatty sometimes. And it will voluntarily reduce its window size without dropping traffic. The way it works is, uh, what the, what the bits are doing, if both bits are set to zero, seven, bits position seven and eight, if they're set to zeros, that means this router does not speak ECN. If both bits are one, that means not only do I speak ECN, then and I set those bits to one, that means I am currently experiencing congestion. And when I send that back to the router that sent it to me, it sees those two ones, that's what triggers it to slow down. Now, if... The other two options, if those bit positions are zero, 01 or 10, that says I speak ECN, but I'm not currently experiencing any congestion, but, but I do speak ECN. So now we're using all bits in that toss byte. Pretty cool. And that's, uh, and I'm not gonna uh, end our discussion of weighted red right now. That's the theory of weighted red, but we're gonna get into a demo in a bit, and I'm gonna demonstrate the configuration of weighted red for you. I think you'll really enjoy that one. Our next topic though is queuing. And we talked about that earlier. We said we could take this one big queue space and we could divide that up into a couple of sub queues. And just by doing that, we're protecting the low talkers from the high talkers, from the bandwidth hogs, if you will. And there are there's so, so many different queuing mechanisms available on Cisco routers. There's weighted fair queuing, there's custom queuing, there's priority queuing, there's distributed weighted fair queuing, there's class-based weighted fair queuing, there's low latency queuing, there's, there's FIFO, there's so many different types of queuing. Here are the two that you're gonna be using today though. Let's just, let's just get up to the present. You're gonna be using class-based weighted fair queuing or CBWFQ, or if you have traffic like voice or maybe even video, that's latency sensitive, it doesn't deal well with delays, then we're gonna use something called LLQ, low latency queuing. Take this example. What I've got on screen here is what we can do with class-based weighted fair queuing. Imagine that we've got this one big queue right now. We're considering all the little sub queues combined. I've got, uh, I've got this one queue, and what I wanna do is divide it up into different sub queues. And that's what we've done here. We've got one sub queue and we're gonna place call signaling traffic, like, um, like the skinny client control protocol or SIP or MGCP. They would go on the call signaling traffic. Network control traffic, critical data, whatever you consider to be critical, bulk data, which is just kind of, <laughs> we don't really care that much about it. It's uh, maybe we're doing a backup, 
as long as it gets there, we're happy. It doesn't have to be first. And then there's something called class default. You see, Cisco says we should create no more. In fact, you tell me, chat it in. Cisco says thou shalt not create more than how many classes of traffic? Go ahead and chat it in. What is that maximum number? You see, if we create too many, if we create too many classes of traffic, like they say, if, if everybody is special, nobody is special. And, and I know there's like a 15 second delay by the time I ask something to the time you hear it through the streaming platform. So I'm currently killing 15 seconds to give you time to chat it in. How, yeah, it's 11. 11 classes of traffic. Bill was the first one I saw type in the correct answer, followed by Michael and lots of other people are coming in with it now. 11 classes of traffic. Well, in addition to that, there's one class of traffic that we get by default. We did not create it. We cannot delete it. It's called class default. It's the catch-all class. So if we didn't match it with one of our classes, it will be matched by class default. And there's something called weighted fair queuing that runs in the class default class. I, I, used, to teach, uh, I used to teach two different quality of service classes and uh, they would run for days. So we got into all the math behind weighted fair queuing. I don't think that's something we need to do here, but it's a pretty good protocol. It's been around forever. But it's a pretty good, uh, or a pretty good queuing mechanism, but let's get into the classes that we create like bulk or critical. Well, let's go to critical data. Notice I said greater than or equal to three megabits per second. Here's what that means. There's a lot of confusion here. When, they, uh, when a lot of people configure this, they say or they think that we're limiting critical data to three megabits per second. Not at all, not at all. Here's what that means. That means during times of congestion, no matter how busy we are with other stuff, I give you my solemn guarantee that even during times of congestion, you can have at least three megabits per second of bandwidth if you need it. And you can have more if you need more and more is available. Now I worked very carefully on that wording. So let me go through that again. That explains what's happening here. I'm saying during times of congestion, I guarantee that you can have at least three megabits per second. So I don't care if every other queue is filled up and overflowing, I can send at least three megabits per second of data out of my critical data queue, guaranteed, no matter how congested we are. I said, you can have at least that much if you need that much. What if I only need one megabit per second at the moment? Remember diff serve, we share with one another. If I've got a couple of meg per second that I'm not using, but network control needs it, yeah, they can use my extra stuff. So you can have at least three megabits per second of bandwidth if you need it, if you don't need it, somebody else can use it. And then I said, you can have more if you need more and more is available. So if I needed five megabits per second, I wasn't guaranteed that I would get that. But if I need five and somebody else, and there's a couple of extra meg free floating around with those other classes, yeah, we'll share with one another. We're a team here. And they will give me that other two megabit per second that I need to get me up to five. So please hear me on this. We are not setting a speed limit with class-based weighted fair queuing. We're giving a minimum bandwidth guarantee. That's the best way I can summarize it. It's a minimum bandwidth guarantee. And we apply that to our 11 different classes of traffic. A challenge with class-based weighted fair queuing though is there's no priority queue. Nobody gets to go first. We're just kind of taking turns and giving everybody their slice of the pie. What if I've got voice or maybe even video that needs to get out of the interface first? Well, we can add a priority queue. This addition of a priority queue takes class-based weighted fair queuing and it turns it into low latency queuing. Low latency queuing is what we might use for voice or video. We could put them in the priority queue and it gets to go first. Now notice, when I say three meg for the priority queue, I am not saying you have greater than or equal to three meg if you need it. I'm saying you have less than or equal to three meg. You see, because we're gonna completely empty the priority queue before we send anybody else, it's kind of like the carpool lane. Uh, now, personally, I don't, I don't like, I, I live in central Kentucky. We don't have a lot of big cities around here with a lot of traffic. 
and I was driving out in LA one time when we went out to Disneyland. That I don't know how y'all do it. That was uh, that was some pretty stressful driving on my part. But there's there's all these lanes of traffic and they're just kind of bumper to bumper traffic. And then we realize, you know, my, my family and I, we're in the car. There there's this diamond lane. There's this carpool lane over on the left hand side, or sometimes they call it the HOV, the high occupancy vehicle lane. So we were able to get over there in that high occupancy vehicle lane, the carpool lane, which was not crowded. And we just started zipping past everybody. Kind of felt guilty, to be honest about it. But they're just kind of sitting still, all congested, and we're just zooming on our way to Disneyland. That's what the priority queue is doing. The priority queue is going to go first. So we're going to completely empty the priority queue. Now, here's the problem. What if I need more than three meg and somebody else lets me have some of their bandwidth? We could start to starve out other traffic. We could starve out our critical data if we just always gave more traffic to the priority queue if it needed it. So that's why I'm saying it's less than or equal to three meg. You can have as much as three meg, I guarantee it, and it can go first. But if you try to go above three meg, bam, we're gonna knock you back down. We're gonna police it, we're gonna limit you. It's where you're not allowed to send more than three meg. So we are giving a, we're not giving a minimum bandwidth guarantee like we do with the class space waiting for queues. We're giving a maximum bandwidth guarantee. We'll never go over three meg because we got to completely empty that thing before anybody else can go. And we don't want to starve anybody else out. And I'll show you in a few moments when we configure this, I'll show you how to configure both class-based weighted fair queuing, weighted red, explicit congestion notification, and low latency queuing. So please stay tuned for that. But that's a look at the theory of queuing. Next up is traffic conditioners. We mentioned this early on. We said traffic conditioners set speed limits for our traffic. Kind of like what we were doing with the priority queue. We said, we're not going to be allowed to go above this limit. And we said we had two types. We had shaping and we had policing. Shaping was the kinder and gentler version, if you recall. That says, you're only allowed to go at uh, two megabits per second. It looks like you're trying to go above that. I'm so sorry. We just don't have bandwidth for you at the moment, but don't go anywhere. Just kind of sit here in this little waiting area. And hopefully when bandwidth demand dies down, we're going to take you out of this waiting area and send you on your way and you'll be fine. Cisco recommends we send this on slower speed interfaces or, or use this on slower speed interfaces. Uh, the reason is this. Policing, remember I said, was kind of like the, the guy on Seinfeld with the soup uh, that says, no bandwidth for you, come back. It, it, policing drops our traffic by default if we try to exceed that speed limit. And on the slow speed interface, we don't want to have to go through a bunch of retransmits and dropping stuff. It's going to slow us down. So shaping, we want to use that on our slower speed interfaces. Policing will, by default, drop traffic. If you try to exceed the speed limit, bam, you're out of here. We're going to throw you away and you'll have to be retransmitted. So we don't delay it, we drop it. And Cisco recommends we use that on higher speed interfaces. And this has got to be one of the most misunderstood quality of service categories there are. Because I say we set a speed limit on something. I go into this router interface and I say that this class of traffic cannot go above, let's say, 10 megabits per second. And it's a 100 meg interface. Some people imagine that I give some magic Cisco IOS commands on that interface and the speed of traffic coming, uh, the speed of the bits exiting that interface magically slow down to, to 10 megabits per second. It, it's a clocked interface. It's clocked at 100 megabits per second. It, it's not possible to send at a, uh, at a constant rate of 10 megabits per second. So how do we do that? How do I send at no more than a, that 10, at 10 meg when my speed is 100 meg? That's where shaping and policing do their magic. And I want to simplify this for you. Now, to make the math really easy, uh, like I said, there's all kinds of policing and all kinds of shaping. Just, uh, just to make the math easy, I'm going to use something called frame relay traffic shaping because it's easy to visualize, but all shaping and policing is kind of a variant of this. We're, we've, got, we've got these three values that I want you to know about for your notes. CIR, that's the committed information rate. The B sub C, that's the committed burst. And the T sub C, 
that is the timing interval. Let me write those out on screen. The, the CIR, that's the speed limit. I don't want traffic to go above this rate. That's the CIR. Notice I've capitalized average. It's the average speed over the period of a second. B sub C, that's the amount of bits or the amount of bytes that I can send during a certain amount of time. That time is called the timing interval. Here's the metaphor I often use. Think of a big, uh, they're, they're doing some road construction up from where I live. They're, I don't know if they're expanding a lane or what, but it's really causing havoc with the traffic right now. But they bring in these big dump trucks and they're dumping rock and stuff in there. Imagine a big dump truck full of bits for shaping. And it, technically it's bits for shaping, it's bytes for policing. But let's focus on shaping. We've got this big dump truck full of bits. And it's going to back up, beep, 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 dump. And it's going to dump a certain number of bits in what Cisco calls a token bucket. Now, here I've got a coffee mug. We could think of a, a token bucket as being this mug. So I'm going to come in and I'm going to dump... A certain amount of bits in this bucket and after I've dumped those bits in that bucket I'm not going to be able to send any more uh, and and I've completely emptied those I send those back out at line rate my buckets empty what do I do now I was given some bits I sent them at line I have to send at line rate there's no other option so what do I do I have to wait until a timing interval rolls around again and the dump truck is going to come back and it's going to dump in a bunch more bits into my bucket. Uh, let, me, let me illustrate it like this. With frame relay traffic shaping, we take a one second period of time and we divide it into eight different time slots. One eighth of a second, uh, which is 0.125 seconds, I think. So we've got these eight different timing intervals. Now, let's do the math. My line speed in this example is 128K. My speed limit that I want to set is half that, 64K. That's the paradox. How can I send at half the line rate when I just said we have to send to the line rate? Well, if my timing interval is 0.125 seconds and my speed limit is 64,000 bits per second, we can do some quick algebra we can multiply 64,000 by 0.125, and that's going to give us 8,000. That means during every timing interval, we're going to be dumping in 8,000 bits into our, into our bucket. And then we're going to send those bits at line rate. And then our bucket's empty. And it's going to stay empty until the next timing interval comes around. So here's what, I'll, I'll, let me illustrate this. During the first timing interval, we send 8,000 bits and we send it at a line rate. But then we're empty. We got no more bits to send. Bam. We send nothing for 1 16th of a second. And then at that next timing interval, dump truck comes in, dumps another 8,000 bits in. We get another 8,000 bits that we can send at line rate and then we're out. Bam. Nothing. Y you see the issue here? We send and we stop. We send and we stop. We're not sending all the time. That means by starting and stopping and starting and stopping, that means over the period of a second, I would have sent 8,000 bits eight times. You see where I'm going with this? If I sent 8,000 bits eight times, I just sent 64,000 bits per second. Here's a metaphor to help you think about it. Let's imagine that after, after class today, I'm going to jump in my car and I'm going to go see a friend. And let's imagine my friend lives 60 miles away. And I get in my car, I'm in a rush, I haven't seen him for a while, and I'm driving to my friend's house and I look down at my speedometer and it says I'm going 120 miles an hour. And wouldn't you know what, the uh, law enforcement official pulls me over on my way. And they say, Mr. Wallace, do you realize you were driving at, at 120 miles an hour? I could honestly say, Actually, officer, I was driving at 60 miles per hour. That, that's a true statement. Because, you see, over the period of an hour, I would have traveled 60 miles. <laughs> Admittedly, I was going really, really fast for that first 30 minutes. 
But for the next 30 minutes, I'm parked in my friend's driveway. Over the period of an hour, I travel sick. I was, okay, don't tell that to a law enforcement official. I don't recommend that. But that's the way it does work with policing and shaping. And the example we just considered uh, could uh, be applied to either shaping or policing. Again, shaping is going to be adding bits into our bucket. Policing is going to be adding bites into our bucket. And what we considered is pictured here. We've got a bucket with a capacity of B sub C. So if we were dealing with shaping, we would put B sub C bits every timing interval into this bucket. With policing, we would put B sub C bytes into this bucket every timing interval. And we would only have one possible action, conforming. We would never go faster than the speed limit, the CIR, because there are simply never enough bits or bytes to do that. However, what if we had a bigger bucket? What we could do is have a bucket that would hold more than B sub C bits or bytes. We could make it deeper and we would call that top level B sub E. That's the excess burst as opposed to B sub C, the committed burst. Here's the idea. Let's say that during one timing interval, we dump in 8,000 bits like we talked about. But during that next timing interval, we don't need to send 8,000 bits. We just need to send maybe 2,000 bits. That's going to leave a residue of 6,000 bits still in the bucket when the next timing interval comes along and we dump in an additional 8,000. If our bucket is deep enough, suddenly we have 14,000 bits in that bucket that we can send at line rate. That's going to give us a sustained burst above our CIR if we allow that. And if we allow that, that action where we go above the CIR and we send more than a B sub C a bits or bytes per timing interval, in the policing world, that's called exceeding. And we can actually set up a rule with our policing configuration to say, do this to conforming traffic, maybe transmit it, and do this other thing to exceeding traffic, such as drop it or possibly remark it with a lower priority marking. But this is a single bucket with a single rate, and that rate is the CIR. And keep in mind that shaping does not allow us to say do different things if traffic is exceeding, but we can do that with policing. So focusing on policing for a moment, let's say that we had two buckets. Here we have a CIR bucket that does have a capacity of B sub C bytes, and we've got another bucket that has a capacity of B sub E bytes. This is a dual bucket with a single rate. Again, the single rate is the CIR. If we send more than B sub C bytes in a timing interval, that is going to exceed our speed limit. So that would be an exceeding action. But let's say we had a situation like this. Let's say that we dumped in 10,000 bytes into this B sub C bucket. But during the next timing interval, we only used 5,000 of those bytes. That means we had a residue of 5,000 bytes. The next timing interval comes along, we dump in an additional 10,000 bytes. You see what happens? We're going to overflow from the B sub C bucket into the B sub E bucket because we're not able to hold 15,000 bytes in the B sub C bucket, but we can have some bytes spill over, if you will, into that B sub E bucket. And we can say, if there are enough bytes to send the requested traffic in the B sub C bucket, then that is conforming action. If we cannot send the traffic based on the number of bytes in the B sub C bucket, but we can based on the B sub E bucket, that's called an exceeding action. Or if neither bucket independently has enough bytes to send the traffic, we could combine them. And if we could add up all the bytes in both buckets, we could say transmit that. That would be called a violating action. And honestly, violating is usually going to drop traffic. We rarely transmit violating traffic. And one reason is we don't even have a guarantee that we're going to be exceeding our speed limit. You see, even if I say transmit my exceeding traffic and maybe give it a certain marking, there's no guarantee that we're going to do that. The only way that we can do that is if in a previous timing interval, we had some bytes spill over. If we didn't, even though we say do something before exceeding, it's not going to happen. That's with a dual bucket with a single rate. However, there's one other option. We could have a dual bucket with a dual rate where every timing interval, not only are we dumping bytes into the CIR bucket, we've got this other bucket called the PIR, the peak information rate bucket, and we're proactively putting bytes in there as well. This means that 
if we're not able to send traffic from the CIR bucket alone, and we say, well, if it's exceeding, then send it from the PIR bucket. We actually will have bytes in that PIR bucket, or we might have had them with a dual bucket single rate, but here we are proactively populating that PIR bucket. And again, we've got the options of conforming, if we can send traffic with the bytes in the CIR bucket, exceeding if we can send traffic from the bytes in the PIR bucket, or violating if we can combine the bytes to send the traffic. And that's a look at this metaphor of token buckets that Cisco gives us. Again, with shaping, we don't say we're gonna do something different to exceeding traffic, and we don't talk about violating traffic, but we could have a bucket with shaping that would allow us to periodically burst above the B sub C bits per interval. We just need a bigger bucket, but it's policing where we can get really granular and say, do this if we're exceeding, do this if we're violating, and that's where we can have a couple of buckets. And that's a look at our two different types of traffic conditioners, shaping and policing. Our next topic is configuration, MQC configuration, and it's a three-step process. What we're gonna do is take our class maps, remember we're gonna create no more than 11 of those class maps, and we're going to categorize, uh, we're going to categorize our traffic into those class maps, and then we're going to create a policy map. And that policy map is going to say, how are we going to treat those different classes of traffic? Then we're going to take that service policy, we're using the service policy command, we're going to take that policy that says treat this traffic this way and this traffic this way, and we're going to apply that to an interface. Typically to an interface, that's another story. But uh, yeah, it's a three-step process. Create a class map, create a policy map, apply it to an interface. And I want to give you a pretty thorough demonstration now out on some live gear. In fact, let me take you out to that live gear and I'm gonna take my face off the screen, that way you can see the, the terminal just a little bit better. And let's set up, and this is gonna answer the question about priority and, uh, and, and the bandwidth command. But here on router R1, I'm gonna start, it's going to global configuration mode, and I'm gonna create some of those uh, class maps. Step one of MQC, that's where we're classifying our traffic. I wanna say class map, and what I wanna do now is I wanna match different email traffic. And think about it, there's, there's a lot of protocols that fall under the category of email. There's POP3, there's IMAP, there's Microsoft Exchange, there's uh, SMTP. I wanna be able for, I want all of those protocols to go into this queue, this sub queue that's for email. So if I give some context sensitive help, you'll notice that we've got, we, we've got some options here. We've got a match all option and we've got, if I can highlight that, we've got match all and we've got match any. The default, please put this in your notes, the default is match all. This means that in order for a packet to go in this queue, it's gonna match every single criterion. Now, <laughs> I'm trying to match all these different email protocols. It's just not possible for a packet to simultaneously be POP3 and IMAP and SMTP. That's, that's just not possible. So what do we do instead? We're gonna say we want to match any of the following. That's what I wanna do in this case. I'm gonna say class map match hyphen any. And I'm gonna call, I'm, you can come up with whatever name you want, I'm just gonna call this class map email. And then I can match a variety of protocols or a variety of markings. I love this option. I love match protocol. If I say match protocol, it's gonna use a feature called NBAR, network-based application recognition, that's going to allow me to match a lot of different protocols. Look at that. It just goes on and on and on. All of these are recognizable by uh, by MQC. So I wanna match the protocol of POP3. I also want to match the protocol, uh, POP3 is used to retrieve email. I wanna match the protocol of SMTP that's used to send email. Another protocol that receives email is IMAP. We might be using a Microsoft Exchange server. We can match that traffic. So I wanna match any of those and I want it to go into the email class map. Let's create another class map. I'll create a class map and I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna name this one voice. And my voice over IP traffic will go here. Now, I did not say match any. And I did not say match all, uh, I didn't say match any or match all, did I? Let me make sure I did up here. Yeah, I, I did say match any up above. Yeah, 
I didn't say match in or match all because I'm only going to give one match statement. So it doesn't matter. I don't need to do that Boolean evaluation. I've only got one protocol. And the protocol that streams voice is RTP. I'm going to say match protocol RTP. Now, RTP also is used for video. So I could be really specific here. I could say I want to match just audio. Or if I wanted to be really specific, I could give a payload type. That's going to give me a certain codec that's used by voice. That's getting really advanced. I'll just say, just match audio. So that's going to match my voice traffic. Let's do, um, let's do one more. Let's, let's make a class for our not so desirable traffic. Scavenger traffic, we call it sometimes. I'll say class map protocol. Let's see, um, class map. Oh, sorry. I got to give it a name. Class map scavenger. It's kind of a harsh name, but what do I want to match? I want to match the protocol of uh, BitTorrent. Now, before you jump on my case about this, yes, I know many businesses use BitTorrent for very legitimate purposes, but come on, sometimes it's used to download movies illegally. So let's just say for our business purposes, it might be different for you, but for our business purposes, we have no use for BitTorrent. So we want to treat it not so good. So that was step one of MQC. I've created my class maps. I can say do show class hyphen map, and we're gonna see the class maps that we created. And notice there's also, if I can get my arrow to behave, we also have this other class map that I mentioned earlier called class hyphen default. That's the catch all class map. It's gonna match anything that we did not match. Let's do step two of MQC. Let's create a policy map. Here, we're gonna say, policy hyphen map, and I'll give it a name. I'll just say demo. And not much happens here. There's not a lot of options. The, the magic happens. I call it the magic mode. It ha happens in policy map class configuration mode. I'm going to say class, and I'm going to give the name of one of our email, uh, one of our classes we created. One of them was email. Notice that I'm now not in policy map mode. I'm in policy map class configuration mode. And here's where I get to say what its behavior is going to be. This is what we talked about earlier. I could do things like policing. I could do, let me highlight that. We can do policing. I could do, I could do shaping. We're gonna talk about priority with LLQ. We'll talk about bandwidth with class-based weighted fair queuing. We'll talk about random detect with weight. Let's just get into it. For my email traffic, let's say that it does not need priority treatment. It just needs to be in one of those class-based weighted fair queuing classes. So for that, I'm going to use the, the command bandwidth. The unit of measure here is in kilobits per second. And let's say that I want to give it 512K. Remember what this says. This says, I guarantee during times of congestion, you can have at least 512K of bandwidth if you need it and more if you need more and more is available. That sets up class-based weighted fair queuing. But remember weighted red we, we want to drop some of our lower priority traffic possibly uh, high, uh, or sooner, or, or the high drop probability stuff should be dropped before the low probability stuff. Let's turn on weighted red. To do that, I say random, random hyphen detect. If I could spell, that would be super helpful. Random hyphen detect. Now, warning, warning, if I just press enter here, it's gonna be paying attention to IP precedence values. That's not what we want, probably. We want to pay attention to DSCP values. So I'm going to say DSCP hyphen based. So random detect DSCP based. That turns on weighted red, and we're paying attention to DSCP values. So a packet marked with AF113, it's going to be dropped before a packet that's marked with AF11. Remember explicit congestion notification? where we could be more civilized and we could just ask the sender to slow down. We can turn that on by saying random hyphen detect ECN. That turns on ECN. I think that's, that's the only policy I want to apply to my email traffic. What about my voice traffic? I'll say for my class called voice, we had the question earlier, what's the difference between the bandwidth command and the priority command? The bandwidth command is going to be used to give a minimum bandwidth reservation for a non-priority queue. I want to put my voice in, in the priority queue. So I'm going to give the keyword of priority, and I'm going to say 256. 
I'm going to say my voice traffic can have as much as 256 kilobits per second of bandwidth if it needs it, but no more. Remember, we're policing it. We're dropping everything above 256 because we don't want to starve anybody else out. That makes this a low latency queuing configuration. And what about that not so desirable traffic? The scavenger class, let's back out again. I'll say, uh, I'll say class scavenger. Here, I want to police traffic exceeding a certain limit. I could say police and tricky here, the unit of measure is no longer kilobits per second, it's bits per second. Maybe I want to limit this to 8,000 bits per second. And if I just, uh, actually, I'll make it a little bit more generous. I'll say 128 kilobits per second. How about that? Now, I could go and say, if the action is conforming, then I'll transmit it. If it's exceeding, I'll drop it. But if I just press enter right here, that is the default behavior. Conforming traffic will be transmitted. Exceeding traffic will be dropped. And now, that's step two of MQC. I'm ready to apply it. So let's go into interface gig zero slash two and let's apply this. I'm gonna say service hyphen policy. I give the name of my policy map and I also say in what direction is it being applied? Here's a, here's a caution for you. Not all of our quality of service mechanisms can be applied in either direction. For example, policing, I could apply that inbound or outbound. Shaping can only be applied outbound. So I'm gonna say output demo. That was the name of my policy map and I'm done. And even though I could do a show class map like I did earlier, I could do a show policy map. Here is my absolute favorite. I think this is the most powerful command if you wanna jot it down for viewing your QoS configuration. I'm gonna say show policy hyphen map for interface gig zero slash two. The reason I say this is more powerful for this interface, it's going to show me my class maps. It's going to show me what my policy mapper is doing, and it's going to give me packet and byte counts to make sure I'm really matching traffic. So you can see here, I've got this class called email, and we see what's going into email. POP3, SMTP, IMAP, Microsoft Exchange. I'm matching any of those. What am I doing? We can see that I'm limiting it, or I'm saying you can have at least 512K of bandwidth if you need it, more if you need more, and more uh, is available. For our voice class, we see that it is getting priority treatment, priority of 256K, and we are policing it, and you see the, uh, you see the committed burst value that we're using for that policing. Scavenger traffic, you see the CIR is 128,000 bits per second. We're dumping in 4,000 bytes every timing interval. And if we were matching traffic, it would show us the number of packets that have exceeded, the number of bytes that have exceeded, the number of packets and bytes that have conformed to the speed limit. So that is, uh, again, my favorite, that's my favorite verification command. So I hope you enjoyed that demonstration. Uh, that, hopefully that tied together a lot of the theory that we've been talking about uh, throughout today. So we just did our MQC demo. And in our next, in our next module, I want to talk about a, it's sort of a macro. It's called auto QoS. It's going to give us a way to set up a fairly robust quality of service configuration with just one or at a maximum three commands. You're going to like this. There are three different versions of auto QoS, and I'll tell you when I would use one versus the other versus never use it. There's one, this is the first one that came out. It's on a router and it's auto QoS VOIP. It's focused on voice over IP, making sure that the voice traffic gets treated best, that it gets, that it gets placed in a priority queue. There's also auto QoS for a switch. And that's going to make the uh, that's going to make sure the switch is getting uh, giving optimal treatment to our to our voice traffic. And then Cisco updated a little bit, and they said, you know what? We've got more than voice traffic that might need some quality service treatment. 
So this is the most advanced version of all. It's called AutoQS Enterprise. It just runs on a router, not a switch. But with AutoQS Enterprise, we go into sort of a, an observation mode for Cisco recommends two or three days. We basically say, keep an eye on the traffic flowing across this interface. And it's gonna learn how much tell that traffic you use, hopefully none. It's gonna learn how much uh, HTTPS traffic you use, how much voice traffic you use, what are you doing with video. It's gonna learn what the day in the, uh, a day in our life looks like for traffic on that interface. And if you're happy with the way traffic has behaved during that time of day, the percentages of bandwidth utilization, you can say, yeah, it's been a good couple of days. Show me what policy you would recommend to enforce that behavior all the time. And they'll say, all right, based on what we've seen, here is my recommended configuration. And it, it's, it's extensive. And if you like that, you can say, apply it. And you're going to, remember those 11 classes of traffic? It's gonna populate as many as 10 of those. There's one thing it doesn't do. It doesn't know what you consider to be mission critical. It's not that clairvoyant to, what, to know what you consider to be mission critical. So that is not gonna be populated, but the other 10 might be if it sees traffic that would fall into those other 10 categories. And then you can go back and tweak it if you want to. Now, I wanna demonstrate this for you. I wanna show you all three versions in the live interface. Again, I'll take my, my face off the screen so we can see this a bit better. And I'm gonna go over to, I'm gonna go over to switch. Uh, actually, let's start off on the router, shall we? On the router, go back to R1 here. If I wanna turn on auto QS, we can only do this, we cannot do this on an ethernet interface, first of all. It's gotta be done on an interface, like a serial interface that's running HDLC or point-to-point -point protocol or frame relay, or if we had an ATM interface, it would work there, but it's, it's on WAN interfaces. So I'm gonna go in, let's go into global configuration mode, and I'm gonna go into interface serial zero slash one slash zero. And I'm gonna say auto QoS VOIP, and let's give some context sensitive help. We could just press enter right now, but we could give this trust keyword. Let's see what that's all about. If I say trust, it's going to trust markings coming from a Cisco IP phone. I'll just leave that off. I'll just say, yep, yeah, take care of my voice traffic. And if I then say, show me what just got created there. In fact, let me, let me do, this will be easier. I'll say show class maps. Now we just created three class maps. W uh, we said that by default, we had this class default class. Uh, we also had uh, the voice class, the email class, the scavenger class. Notice what just happened when I typed in that single command. It created this class of traffic that's matching these different DSCP markings. This is voice payload. This is voice. Uh, this is what Cisco recommends for for vo uh, for voice signaling. This is what Cisco used to recommend for voice signaling, uh, thirty one, or maybe that. Uh, or uh, yeah, they used to recommend this for voice signaling. They changed it to CS three. They also created one auto QS VIP control untrust, and that's matching an access list. Let's see, show access hyphen lists. Look at that. It is matching control traffic in these different ranges. So port 1720, uh, let's see, I think that's, uh, I think that's, I think that's skinny, 2427, 2428, I think that's MGCP. Uh, oh no, I'm sorry. Uh, this is H.323, this is skinny. This is SIP down at the bottom. It's been a little while since I looked at those. Uh, and here we're matching our RTP traffic, oh, excuse me, RTP control traffic. UDP ports in that range. So let's look at our policy map. I'll say polic show policy hyphen map. In addition to the one that we created, it's got a policy map called auto QS policy untrust. And you see what it's doing. It's giving 70% of bandwidth to our RT RTP traffic. It's giving 5% of our bandwidth to voice control traffic. And it lets everybody else use the other, uh, uh, use the other queue, the, like the class have a default queue. So one command, that's a pretty robust configuration, I think you would agree. But 
I honestly wouldn't use it very much because it's only considering voice. You know what I would do on a switch? It, it also only considers voice. Let me move over to my switch really quickly. If I can find it here. Let's move over to my switch and let's do auto QoS. Here, I've got a couple of Cisco IP phones attached. Let's do a show CDP neighbors to see where they are. Yeah, these are a couple of Cisco IP phones and they're attached to fast ethernet zero slash 13 and zero slash 14. So I just want to apply auto QoS to interfaces connected to IP phones. Let's go into global configuration mode and I'm gonna go into interface range configuration mode so I don't have to configure them individually. We're gonna configure them all at once. I'm gonna say interface range fast ethernet zero slash 13 dash 14. Now you'll notice that I am in not just interface configuration mode, I'm in interface range configuration mode. And I'm gonna say auto QoS VOIP, let's use some context sensitive help again. And I can trust traffic if it's coming from a Cisco phone. I can trust traffic if it's coming from a, a software version of a Cisco IP phone. And I can say, what exactly am I trusting? Am I trusting that phone's DSCP marking? Or am I trusting that phone's COS marking? Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna say auto QoS VOIP, you know what? I'm gonna say VOIP Cisco iPhone phone. Cisco iPhone phone, there, there we go. And that's gonna trust markings coming from my Cisco IP phone. Now, check out what just happened with that one command. It's very, very extensive. When we talk about switch QS in a little bit, you're gonna see that it's much, much, much more complex than, than we would have with, uh, with a router. Look at all these MLS QS commands. These all got added from that one command. We're setting different thresholds and drop thresholds and how many packets we can hold in different buffers. I wouldn't think to do all this without consulting a whole lot of documentation. So it did all of that for us. That's pretty amazing. It still created some class maps. It still created a policy map even on our switch configuration. And for the interfaces connected to the IP phones, it's telling the phones to go into the priority queue so they get to go first. We're trusting class of service and we're trusting class of service if and only if it comes from a Cisco IP phone. That's pretty amazing. That, this is something I would use and probably not touch. On a switch, if I've got a port connected to a Cisco IP phone, pretty much every day, I'm gonna go in here, I'm gonna say auto QS VIP trust or Cisco hyphen phone and leave it because it's an awesome configuration. I love it. But let's go back to the router a second. I said that there was a, a new and improved version of something that we could do on a router and it's called auto, Q, uh, it's called auto QS Enterprise. With, uh, with Enterprise, I said, before we apply something, just rubber stamp a policy on this router, we're gonna get to know the traffic patterns on this router. I'm gonna go into global configuration mode and there's a prerequisite for this. We have to be running Cisco Express forwarding. So I'm gonna say IP Ceph, just to make, it's probably on by default, but I just wanna make sure it's on. And I'm gonna go into my serial interface again. I'll say interface serial zero slash one slash slash zero. And you know what? I think I've already got a policy applied there. Let me do no service hyphen policy output demo. I think I've already, I think I still had that applied. So I go into that interface and I'm gonna say, auto discover QoS and I'll press enter and then we wait. Cisco recommends we wait about two or three days and it's gonna be just observing and making notes on traffic patterns that it sees. Now, obviously we're not waiting two or three days. We're not gonna even wait two or three minutes. Let's just assume that it has learned a lot of stuff and we come back two or three days later and we say, show me what you learned. We can say, Show auto discovery QoS for interface serial zero slash one slash zero. And it says, here's the recommendation. Obviously there was no traffic passing this, so it doesn't have a big recommendation. But if this were on a production network, it would have as many as 10 class maps created 
with policy, a policy map saying what to do for each of those classes of traffic. And if we were happy with that, then we would say, okay, let's, let's use that. I'll go back into interface serial zero slash one slash zero. And I'll say, all right, do it. I'll say auto QoS. And uh, because there was no data discovered, it doesn't do anything. But if it had discovered data, if it had learned our traffic patterns, it would apply that. That is uh, now, would I use this? Absolutely. Would I stop with this on a router? Probably not. This is going to give me a, a great base quality of service configuration for a router, but I might want to go tweak something else that it, um, that AutoQS didn't know about, a certain business need we have. But that's a great starting point. That saved me a lot of time. That's AutoQS. And there's also QoS on wireless networks. Let's think about how wireless networks function. If you remember, uh, if we've got two wireless devices and uh, they're trying to talk to uh, the same access point, unless we're running Wi-Fi 6, which is a different story, if we're running traditional Wi-Fi, they're using something called CSMACA, Carrier Sense Multiple Access with Collision Avoidance. They're going to listen to the airwaves to see if anybody else is talking at the moment. And if the coast is clear, they'll, they'll transmit. Because we cannot have two transmissions hitting that access point at the same time. If there is a collision, because maybe, maybe both of these wireless clients, they were listening to the same period of silence. So what do they do? Well, they're going to say, ops, uh, my bad. Um, I'm going to try to transmit again, but I'm going to wait. I'm going to back off a random amount of time before I try to do this again. That's the way CSMACA works. But from a quality of service perspective, what if we told our high priority traffic, yeah, if this happens, you need to back off, but you don't need to back off as long as a low priority packet. We'll, we'll make them back off a lot longer. Here's what I mean. With quality of service and wireless networks, we're gonna break our categories down into into only four categories, no, no, no 11 categories here. This is called WMM, Wi-Fi Multimedia. We've got four categories. There's one for background processes that are just, we don't really care about that much. Best effort, just kind of your run of the mill, web surfing kind of stuff. And then there's voice and video. And remember earlier we talked about a COS marking? We said that was a layer two marking that we were using three bits inside of one of those tag bytes in a dot one Q frame. What if I'm sending it from my laptop? What if I'm sending a frame from my laptop and I want to mark a quality of service marking? I'm not on a trunk. How do I send a layer two marking from my laptop? Well, if my laptop supports it, I'm going to use something called dot one P. Dot one P is also going to add four extra bytes to your frame, just like dot one Q does. Dot one P is also going to use three bits in those four bytes to create a class of service value, just like dot one Q does. So what's the difference? Dot one Q is going to have a field that's going to specify what VLAN this frame is a member of. Dot one P does not do that. Dot one P leaves all those bits at zeros. So that's the slight subtle distinction between those two. And we're going to take those eight possible COS markings we talked about, or dot one P markings in this case, and we're going to map them to these four different categories like you see here. Now, what does it mean that we're treating some traffic with best effort and we're treating some traffic with, uh, like voice, we're treating it better. What, what does that, exactly does that mean? Well, think about how CSMACA works. If there is a collision, we're going to back off a random amount of time. Well, for high priority traffic, we're going to back off a smaller amount of time. We're going to, we're going to try to transmit a lot more aggressively if we're higher priority traffic. And also, when we send frames, we don't just send one frame and hot on the heels of that first frame, here comes another frame. No, there's a gap between them. It's called an, it's called an inter, uh, interframe space. And for lower priority traffic, that gap is going to be bigger. We're not going to send as aggressively. It's not like, uh, it's not like uh, in the movie Elf. I remember, you know, Buddy the Elf, and he's throwing those snowballs as fast as he can. 
th that's what our high priority traffic is going to do. It's not going to have much of a gap between the snowballs, between our frames. It's going to go wow, 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 wow. While the lower priority traffic, there's going to be some gaps. That's how we can give different priority uh, treatment to wireless packets. Give them different back off times and give them different gaps between the frames. And the final thing we're going to discuss today is how to do quality of service on a Cisco Catalyst switch. Now, again, I made this statement earlier. Please hear me on this. Check your documentation. Your mileage may vary. I created this for a Cisco Catalyst 3750 series switch because this is what a CCIA collaboration candidate is going to run into when they go take the CCIA lab. And I was creating some CCA collaboration training. That's why I'm using this particular switch model, but it differs a little bit. But in a 3750 series switch, we've got, we can take that egress interface going out and we can break it down into four sub cues, four different sub cues. Now of those sub cues, cue number one and only cue number one can be used as a priority cue. Remember, the priority queue is going to be emptied first before we send traffic from anybody else. And each of these queues have three thresholds. Threshold one, threshold two, we can say where they're located. And then threshold three is when we're at capacity, when our queue is all the way at the top. And we can come up with some rules to say, I want to put different COS values in these different queues. Now, for my voice traffic, my, my voice signaling traffic, uh, let's say video traffic. Video traffic typically uses a COS of four. Voice traffic uses a COS of five. Th those are priority frames. So I say, I wanna map those values into Q1. They're gonna go first. Maybe I put six and seven, which we're really not supposed to use anyway, into Q2, I'll put COS three, that's our signaling traffic. I'll put it in its own Q, Q3, and then, I, I can use these thresholds. I can say for Q number four, I'll put in COS values of zero and one and two, but I'll put in COS zero traffic until we hit that first threshold. If we exceed that first threshold, I'll, I'm gonna drop all of my COS zero traffic. I'll still, accept, um, I'll still accept COS one and two, but I'm gonna drop COS zero. So until I hit threshold two, I'm accepting now COS1 and COS2. Once I exceed threshold two, now I'm only accepting a class of service two. So we can have different drop thresholds within a queue. Now I wanna go through an example with you. I'll, I'll show you the syntax on screen. If, uh, let me say this first. We could have had a deep dive session just on switch QoS and it would have lasted about two hours. <laughs> In fact, I, one of the most watched YouTube videos I have is setting up quality of service on a 75, or excuse me, a 3750 series catalyst switch. You might want to go watch it if you want to go deeper here. I, I didn't think it would be a good use of our time today to cover all that because that's in another YouTube video you can go watch. It's about an hour, 40, hour, 45 minutes long. It covers everything you would ever want to know about quality of service on a switch. But let me just kind of give you a sense for what it's like. Here's the goal we have. We want to configure quality of service settings on this switch such that our COS values are gonna be converted into appropriate DSCP values. But remember, a COS value is not gonna pass a router boundary. It's gonna, the, the router is gonna say, thou shalt not pass, and it's gonna drop it. So what the switch can do, this is really cool, the switch can take a COS value and it plays an if-then game. If the COS value is five, then the DSCP value is expedited forwarding. And the switch can do that remarking for us. So when that hits a router, it will be forwarded through the router. And we're gonna have our voice signaling traffic coming out of our phone with a COS of three. The actual voice uh, media itself is gonna have a COS of five. The video, if we have a video phone, it's gonna have a COS of four. Now you might assume that our Cisco Catalyst switches are just gonna by default, give their own recommended mappings. But if I just turn on the mappings with the default settings, 
<laughs> they're wrong. Or one or two of them are wrong anyway. So I always like to set this one manually. And I'll show you how to do that. Now, I want to trust COS markings and put those markings into appropriate queues if and only if those markings came from a Cisco IP phone. How do I know they came from a Cisco IP phone? CDP, the Cisco Discovery Protocol, like we just saw, told me it was a Cisco IP phone. Why would I not want to trust other things? Well, you could have malicious users that know about .1P and they could start, or, or DSCP, they could start artificially inflating their own traffic as it's sent into the switch to give their traffic higher priority treatment, trying to beat the system a little bit. So what we can do and what we probably should do is we can assign default COS values to our switch ports. And unless we're trusting something specific like markings that came from a phone, we won't trust anybody else. And we'll just give all that income, all those incoming frames, the default COS value of that port that we've assigned. And I want to put my voice traffic in a priority queue. I want it to be sent first. And on this model of switch, it's only queue number one that can be sent first. So here's the strategy. Here are Cisco's best practice recommendations if you want to take a screen cap of this, if you're in the collaboration world. Cisco recommends that voice signaling traffic be given a marking of, um, of CS3 or, or 24. It didn't used to be. It used to be 41. They changed it. But uh, CS3. Video media should be given a value of AF1. Voice media should be given a value of EF, which is 46. So that's what we want to do. We want to take those COS values of 3, 4, and 5 and map them to those DSCP values. We also want to globally enable quality of service on a switch because on our switch, on the switch we're talking about, quality of service isn't even turned on by default. There's a one command to kind of flip the switch to turn it on. And then we want to change those default mappings because they're pretty bad to start with. And then I want to say that I want to trust COS mappings if and only if those mappings came from Cisco IP phones. And I want to put that voice traffic in a priority queue, which is queue number one on 3750 series switches. So here's the syntax. Number one, got to turn it on. We go into global configuration mode and we just say MLS QoS, bam, enter. And now we're we're allowed to start doing a quality of service things. Here's that mapping command because a COS value does not cross a router boundary. We're going to, we're going to say MLS QoS map COS DSCP. Now, now let me break this down for you. You see after that, we've got eight different decimal values, 0, 8, 16, 24, 30, and on and on. Each of those eight values represent a COS value, starting at zero and going through seven. So we're saying, if you come in with a COS value of zero, you're gonna be mapped to the first number there, a DSCP value of zero. If you come in with a COS value of one, you're gonna be mapped to a DSCP value of eight. If you come in with a COS value of a, th uh, of a two, you'll be mapped to 16. If you come in with a COS value of a, uh, of a three, which is, our signaling traffic, we want to map you to 24. If you come in with a COS value of four video, we're going to map you to 34. If you come in with a COS value of five, we're going to map you to 46. As an example, I said these weren't perfect by default. If you just take the default mappings, your COS value of five is going to be mapped to a DCP value of 40, not 46. So uh, that's CS5, by the way. That's not what we want. It's good, but it, it's not. It's not great. It's not great. It's not EF. So I like to go in and set all those. These are what I would today set those DSCP values to. If you want to take a quick screen cap of that. So we've turned it on. We've set up our mappings. Now I want to say that I trust markings coming from a phone. I'm going to go into interface range configuration mode, like I did earlier for Auto QoS. And here's another common point of confusion that people just really mess up. They go in and they say, MLS, QoS, trust, device, Cisco phone. And they say, bam, done. I'm now going to trust those markings coming from my Cisco phone. They didn't say which marking to trust. 
The, C, uh, the phone's sending it a DSCP marking. It's sending it a COS marking. Which one are we trusting? So first we say, what is it that we're trusting? So, so many people forget that first command. So many people forget to say MLS, QS, trust COS. Now that we say what we're trusting, we can say, all right, let's trust that coming from a phone. And finally, to turn on that priority queue, we're going to say priority queue out for that range of interfaces that are connected to phones. That's going to make them go into Q1 and it's going to make Q1 a priority queue. So that's a fairly basic example of how we might set up quality of service on a Cisco Catalyst switch. If you've got about an hour and 45 minutes to spare and you want to go even deeper and learn how to do policing and shaping and uh, how to map different CUS values to different queues and different thresholds, all that's covered in my YouTube video. Just search for Kevin Wallace QOS Simplified. Seri uh, that's what it's called. Uh, it's called something like Cisco Catalyst 3750 Quality Service Simplified, dot, 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 seriously. Just search for Kevin Wallace QS. It'll, it'll show up. That's if you want to go deeper. But this is plenty for your NA and your NP studies. Mm -hmm.